So, is, it's one of these in-between things. Is this a valid way to do it? Is it socially useful to put out all these predictions that will? Well, they don't make this type of, of predictions public in a general sense for the obvious reasons. They're in the process of testing this now, and it's nowhere near ready, uh, and may never be truly ready for the type of sort of public use that the civil authorities depend upon to actually make some differences. Well, let's jump to another case where there was a, a, a prediction issued. Uh, just last year in, uh, in Italy, uh, in the Apennines, uh, the town of L'Aquila was hit by a, a relatively small but very devastating earthquake. A, um, a researcher, actually a technician, at the nearby physics experiment at Gran Sasso made a prediction. And he based this apparently on, or his reports are, on radon gas. Now radon is a naturally occurring radioactive gas that comes from the ground at very low levels with varying degrees, I mean varying intensities, for a whole bunch of different reasons. And many years ago it had been proposed that maybe earthquakes might have some effect on this. It was studied pretty extensively and there wasn't any correlation. It correlates with rain, barometric changes, wind, all sorts of things can affect radon gas. So it doesn't seem to be reliable, yet this guy was saying he was predicting an earthquake. Well, it generated a lot of problems in the, in the local, uh, with the local authorities. The civil authorities and the seismologists were saying, wait, wait a minute, you can't predict earthquakes based on that. And so there was a lot of, the press, of course, loves this sort of uh, controversy and went, went nuts over it. Well, the earthquake, an earthquake, not exactly where he predicted, not exactly when, but an earthquake that wasn't very far off did occur. And of course then, what you can say, unfortunately, uh, before it took place, at least it was reported that the fact uh, that um, this uh, earthquake, well, in fact, let's, let's jump to uh, so the, the questions about this. A lot of people looked at at it from around the world, and it turns out that he may have made a, 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 a valid prediction, but for the wrong reasons. There were quite a few foreshocks. Now, these are earthquakes that turn out, after the fact, to have occurred before a large earthquake. The problem is, is that these earthquakes cannot be recognized as being different than any other type of small earthquake beforehand. But there was a sequence of them in, in the vicinity. In fact, the local population was feeling them, and they were getting nervous about it, particularly when this so-called prediction did come out. The problem here was that evidently the word went out that these earthquakes were relieving the stress and that therefore earthquake, a big earthquake was even less likely. And of course, that is absolutely wrong. And probably the, the seismologist didn't say that, but it somehow got out somewhere, and you never know how that occurs always. But in fact, some earthquake swarms, that is, a bunch of small earthquakes, end up with a big earthquake. But most swarms don't. So maybe there is something here going on. Maybe there's a pattern. But it's far from easy to recognize it. And every time you see an earthquake swarm, if you predict a large earthquake, you're going to be wrong most of the time. So probably that's not a good technique. Well, another way of trying to anticipate earthquakes uh, that's been tried in the past is to look for the changes in the energy release. This sounds familiar, very much like we've used on volcanoes, that take place before the earthquake in what might be called foreshocks, or just the background seismicity, earthquakes that take place in the vicinity of where a large one's going to occur. For this, I'll use the example of the uh, Sumatra earthquake of 2004 around Christmas, magnitude 9.2, 9.3, devastating. If you look at a fairly large area around where that ended up, and you plot up the cumulative energy released in these smaller earthquakes, now these are still magnitude 5 and 6 type of earthquakes in this vicinity, then you, you, you get a curve that does not fall on a straight line. Now, earthquakes were totally random and weren't, quote, leading to something. You would expect them to be sort of occurring at some sort of regular, maybe statistically distributed, but regular rate. But in this case, there's an upward trend to this, accelerating, it's called accelerating moment release or earthquake energy release. And 
that apparently was taking place here. But again, is this very useful? Back in 1995, you might recognize this, but would you say that the earthquake was going to occur you know, in one year, five years, 10, 50 years? Even in, in 2003, and when you saw this very well defined, would you say it was going to occur the following year or in another decade? This type of thing is far from, from clear. And in many other cases where this type of plot is made, you don't see this effect at all. But again, there's some hint that maybe there's something going on. Well, maybe more than just looking at the patterns, we need to understand something about the stress changes that take place when earthquakes occur. And so I'll use another example. Uh, this case from, from Turkey, uh, in which there's a fault very much like the San Andreas Fault in California. It's called the North Anatolia Fault. It runs east-west through northern Turkey. And a few years ago, it was recognized there were several large earthquakes had been progressing more or less east to west over the previous number of decades. This was put together in, in a way to say that, well, when one occurs, it relieves some stress right there, but it generates additional stress or transfers some stress to other parts of the fault. So this stress transfer model was proposed to explain this progression of earthquakes. I'll show you a blow up here of the, uh, the North Anatolia Fault and a little, little movie that illustrates this, this process in which as the earthquake occurs, the stress is released or the hazard is reduced right along that fault, but off the ends of it, it's increased, shown by the red color. So we'll start this off and let it progress through. You can see it's moving more or less east to west. And then in 1999, we get the Izmit earthquake. Devastating earthquake just east of Istanbul that caused many casualties, lots of destruction. So it wasn't really formally predicted, but there was a hint that this type of progression was, was coming. Well, that, that was 99, the Izmit earthquake. What about... What about now? What's, what's sort of next on the horizon? Well, let's zero in on the area around Istanbul. And again, look at the way it looked right before, isn't it? This is just before it. You can see that bright area uh, just near the town, the city of Izmit. And then that earthquake occurred, and it redistributed the stress in an area now just south of Istanbul, the Sea of Marmara. Well, this is a zone that's now highlighted um, as being higher stress or higher hazard. So now is this a, a valid prediction? Well, we don't know. So far, that earthquake has not occurred. Uh, certainly, the, the civil authorities in Istanbul are aware of this. There's lots and lots of poor construction there, far more that can be upgraded or retrofit to survive this but they are taking measures to make sure their emergency response uh, techniques and facilities are in reasonably good shape. But, I don't know, we refer back to Istanbul was one of these places on that earthquake or that uh, forecast of earthquake disasters map, as there are many other places in the world. 